finding out that many don't, there are some that don't know what three hot sakat is. Like they see hot sakat and they're like, what is that? They're completely lost. They don't have any understanding. I'm like, I should have thought of that when I went through this naming and branding situation with hot sakat. Hey guys, Alex here. If you're hearing this right now, it means you're such a big fan of Mops and Moes that you're listening to this episode immediately after it released. I procrastinated on editing, and now it's Saturday night right before it publishes, and I'm realizing that Drew and I did not record an intro. In the next day or two, this section will be replaced with our normal banter and intro section, but for now, I'll just explain why we wanted to do this episode in particular. There has been a lot of discussion lately about two big quality of life issues around the military. First, the state of barracks and their maintenance and second, the state of dining facilities, or in some cases, the lack of any accessible dining facilities. It's easy to complain about these things, but it's harder to really make a difference in fixing them, but our guest for this episode is doing exactly that. Rob Evans is a former Army sergeant with 12 years of service who concluded his military service as a fueler, a 92 Fox. Leveraging over a decade of information technology experience, he recently transitioned into a role as a software developer. Combining both his Army experience and his software skills, he recently created an app called Hots and Cots that's been getting a bunch of attention. You'll find some links to news articles in the show notes. It is essentially Yelp for military installations, but we'll also be diving into how it's doing a lot more than you might think by collecting some of these reviews. Uh, most notably, giving Rob the tools to bring attention to these and hold leaders accountable. Uh, Rob lives outside of Charlotte, North Carolina with his wife and two boys, and outside of work, he loves running, weightlifting, in the outdoors. Oh, and coffee. He makes a special note of loving coffee. As you listen to the work Rob is doing, if you're in the military, please encourage anyone you work with to download the app and help give Rob the information and the tools he needs to really push this one forward. You'll hear during the episode, he's built relationships with command teams, senior leaders, things like that. that are really getting some of these issues fixed in a constructive way. And he can only do that if people are logging in and submitting reviews. So with that, enjoy the episode. No, I want to ask who's eating at more defects. Well, there's a good chance Rob is eating at the most defects. Well, most meals at defects, Rob probably wins. 12 years in, three deployment, yeah. I, that's all we had was defects. My uh, my defect history is weird. Because like, as a as a lieutenant and a captain, I ate breakfast at the defect almost every day. Um, lunch and dinner, not so much, though. And then as a civilian, I kind of continued eating breakfast at the defect. And also because my job was to like travel around the Army and talk to people about health and fitness stuff i ended up eating it a lot of different defects all over the army so i've got a wide sample but maybe not as much not as many meals do you count eating at a defect which you're deployed if there is one i mean i think most people would agree and you can you can either agree or disagree i did not deploy um all of my stuff was like to non-combat places um i got some pretty cool travel out of the military actually um so okay. i can't claim that one but uh that's pretty cool. But the general trend seems to be that deployed defects were distinctly better than garrison defects. Yeah, uh, the deployed defects were, were pretty nice. I mean, it was sky's the limit. Was it you guys that sent, Alex, you sent me the picture of the, um, what was it, a C-17 with like a Burger King truck pulling out of it or something? Yeah, Burger King has like deployable restaurants yeah. that can be like containerized. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, and I think I'm okay with um, fast food, like, forward deployed. It's when it's on post that I just... Part of it is for, uh, for like, sense of home and, like, comfort stuff. Like, people do get value out of that, and that legitimately is part of the doctrine. But I would I would kind of agree that we've overdone it at home, for sure. There was something comforting going to, like, a Subway or a Green Beans when you're when we were, when I was overseas. Or... It wasn't the same. It didn't quite taste the same but it was still like there was some comfort to it so maybe before we dive into like how we feel about defects and barracks and all those things we start with like the origin story of hots and cots you want to explain that to us 
Uh, sure, I can do that. So there wasn't a, like, there was, it was multiple events. It wasn't one singular thing. I was like, hey, I'm going to write this app. So it, it kind of started with, I've been involved in the Reddit community on military side of the like, military subreddit and army subreddit as a user and then a moderator. And I'd see the posts of people posting things they, they'd come across in the dining facility, raw, raw chicken, whatever you want. And then they're the barrack situations. So you, I'd see that uh, kind of happen over time. And then recently, like maybe a month before the GAO report came out, somebody asked me, hey, would you be okay? If, they're actually little kids. They were like, would you be okay if your kids wanted to join the military? And I would. I'm not going to stop them. Uh, I'm going to support them in what they want to do. But I would also share with them the current situation and kind of what I experienced and what the military is like. And then the GA, GAO report came out a month later. And I was talking to Paul, a friend of mine, and he knows I'm a software engineer, software developer, uh, my full-time job. And I've done some like fun little like indie apps on the side. And he's like, listen, you have like, an opportunity here to create something big that isn't being done, which is hot and cots. Like find a way for soldiers to review their meals, to review their barracks. And you can like social media, uh, take an approach of social media to it. So we started brainstorming some ideas between him and uh, some other people that are currently still serving. And some of their veterans that are just mainly staying behind the scenes because of their positions. And we took what was in the GAO report and, basically made it into what is now hots and cots. Um, so all the questions are something that can be related back to the GAO report, something that the DOD can use. Um, and at the same time, get the attention of leadership so they can see how soldiers are living, what they're eating, um, but also the good stuff too. Like we want to see the, how soldiers are making barracks their own space. Um, it's, but you can also see what dining facilities are capable of. Um, I think it was Fort Cart. It might have been Fort Carson, actually. I got to go back and look, but there was like this really stellar meal. It looked like it was prepared by like a Michelin restaurant. Um, so you know what dining facilities are capable of, and then there's the situations like where you get sometimes so you're giving raw chicken. Um, so that's a long-winded answer of kind of how Hots and Cup came to be, and it, it's kind of evolved and, and changed as time has gone on. Um, because the GAO report came out in September, and I really wanted to get something out fast. So it, I got a really early alpha version out to users, and then I progressively updated and changed the app to be more user-friendly and a little bit more seamless as well. Can you talk about, I guess, two, two questions here, because for some people, they don't even know what a GAO report is. And then can you mention specifically for this one kind of what, what it said that kind of drove you to create this? Uh, so the GAO, I'm, I'm looking over this way just because I, I had some notes over here, is the Government Accountability Office, and they did a report of the quality of life for soldiers. It mainly focused on the barracks, but what it does is it goes through and it goes through a select few, a select number of barracks and interviews soldiers and, and does tours and takes pictures of, of, situ of kind of what the living conditions are like. Um, some of the things that came out of the GAO report was um, the big thing is mold. Um, the other thing is how soldiers are living. Um, how many are to a room? Are you sharing a room with three other soldiers? Do you have plumbing issues? Uh, some soldiers talked about how they had to clean up uh, the human remains after a soldier decided to take their life. So it think, talks of things like that. Um, it also talks about some of the views of soldiers where, for example, there's no tracking of the retention versus quality of life. So some soldiers have said, I would stay in, but my quality of life is terrible in these barracks situations. So I don't want to stay in anymore. Uh, so that's kind of the things the GAO report covered at, at a really high level. Uh, another one was, can you lock your door? As simple as like, can you lock your door? Can you close your window? They found squatters living in some barracks. They found one soldier was assaulted. <laughs> And these are military installations. Like, how do we have squatters in a military installation? But apparently they found some. So that that's kind of what the GAO report is. It, it starts and goes through and outlines basically what the DOD requires and what it they sh the, the Army should be following. And it's not just the Army. It's all branches, Air Force, Marines. But this particular report that came out to Pebble was mainly focused on, on the Army. But there is 
uh, notes in the GA report talking about how other branches have these same issues. I was I was laughing because when I picture a squatter, I think of like that stereotypical. This is gonna sound bad, but like that dependipotamus stereotype <laughs> and just some like evil <laughs> ex spouse like in the parish. <laughs> 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 go. I'm gonna get in trouble for that. I'm sorry. Just a little bit. I'm not leaving. This is this is my place now. We we rag on the army a lot for barracks, but I have seen some like pretty horrific stuff in Marine Corps barracks that might be worse than what I've seen in the army. So there's who has which which branch is known for like the best barracks? Is it the Air Force? I think reputationally it would be the Air Force. Yeah. Uh haven't haven't been in the army for a while, and Rob has as well. The the general consensus is that like Air Force has better defects and barracks. Um, but I will say, currently working on an Air Force installation, the defec is awful, um, and that's like compared to any Army defec I've been to. That's a Space Force. That's a Space Force installation. So walk that back. It's true. It is now. It has converted. They changed the signs. It's true. Yeah. So don't don't put that on the Air Force. My my next question is, when I look at your platform, I downloaded your app. I've been on there. I've seen what what's going on and stuff, and on the surface, it is Yelp for defects and barracks. It's a place to provide reviews, throw some pictures on there, stuff like that. But I don't think your goal is to like help people choose the best rated defect on their post or like people don't really get a say in what barracks building they move into. It seems more about crowdsourcing information to help with advocacy, to help talk to senior leaders, to help get change to happen. Am I reading that right? And is it working for that? So it's actually both. So it is also crowdsourcing to help soldiers understand where they're going. So because right now, if you're a single junior enlisted soldier and you're going to Fort Livery, you don't have any idea what your barrack situations look like. Versus if you're going to housing, you can request a work order. You get kind of an idea of the house layout. You're just kind of given what you get. I mean, so just like yesterday, a new soldier was going to Fort Campbell and he, his first room had a, a dead mouse in the corner of the room. So... <laughs> Part of it is to let soldiers know like what they can expect when they go to an installation or if they want to ET, uh, ETS, they want to re-enlist and they have some choices of where they want to go. They can kind of get an idea. But it's also the second part where I want leadership to know what soldiers are living in, how they're living and advocate for them because sometimes, well, not sometimes, I've been that E4, I've been that E3 approached by a captain. And it's really hard to talk to a captain. It's really hard to talk to somebody who's higher ranking. And it, are they really asking me like my opinion? And am I going to get in trouble? Um, so it's that also. I do want to advocate for those junior enlisted newer soldiers to get these issues looked at and resolved. Um, and also at the same time, like this is what you're going to get when you go to this installation. I mean, kind of like off the back of what you just mentioned, does the anonymity piece of this play a big role, do you think? Yes, it does. And it I see that um, you know, like right before I joined this call, uh, our, our podcast, um, I don't know what call podcast, what we want to call it, but I was talking with the Garrison Command Sergeant Major over at Liberty because I'm relaying stuff to him because these junior enlisted soldiers are afraid to go to their leaders. I'm, I'm going to leave this installation out, but we had one lieutenant who went to go to bat for his soldiers to get an issue resolved and he had to do some sort of PowerPoint presentation on um, social media usage because he came to Hatsakots, posted an issue because he couldn't get the issue resolved with his leadership. I have a working relationship with this installation. And so this garrison sergeant major, garrison commander went to this, this unit and said, why is this stuff not getting fixed? They said the PowerPoint presentation wasn't because of Hatsakots in his post, but the timing was very peculiar. Okay. Yeah. So being anonymous is a huge thing. Like I want soldiers to feel like there's a place they can go to get issues resolved and they can post about issues. Um, so yeah, I'm being anonymous is a, is a, was a big part when I just went through and started creating hot to cots. How many installations have actually engaged with you so far? Like actual leadership being like, hey, this is a tool that we think we can help create a better quality of life for our service members. Um, I've had a few kind of like reach out to me on the side, but I have two solid working relationships with installations. Um, that I can go directly to the garrison team and be like, hey, this is an issue. 
um, this is what's going on and, and they will go and get it rectified and, and looked at. I'm trying to grow that, that connection base. Um, I have a, a pipeline through, um, so I have actually, I work with a, um, he's still in, I'm going to butcher this, but basically the guy is part of like insects. He, like he does like the bug inspections and insects. He's a, he's a captain. Entomologist. Yes. He's actually part of kind of does some work for us behind the scenes. And I've been able to get stuff, um, escalated to look at working with him. Cause he has some connections in the pipeline. Why is it, I mean, maybe this is a question for both of you guys, but as a civilian, never been in the military. Why is it that when these problems do seem to get elevated by soldiers through the normal channels, they get ignored. But then when it pops up on a platform like yours and all of a sudden there's like heat on it and it's out there, it's visible. Now all of a sudden it's something that we have to tackle. I just, I don't understand that. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll riff for a second and just say that phenomenon is kind of why mops and mows exists. Oh, I know, but this seems like such an obvious, I, I don't understand how, if I'm a, if I'm like an installation commander and I'm doing like my little walkabout, which I'm assuming they do. And I go into a barracks and there's like a dead body or a mouse or like there's mold on the ceiling. You'd think that they would want to do something about that. I could be wrong. Yeah, it's, I scratch my head too. And it's, it's multifaceted. There's, there's multiple reasons. Um, and I don't, and I'm sure there's more than more reasons than the ones I'm, I'm going to list off. But so you have barracks managers who are over, who oversee the barracks. Unfortunately, they, not all barracks managers are fully dedicated to managed barracks. So they may be doing it part time or they may not have the resources. But when they submit a work order, it goes to DPW and DPW manages these repairs. And they'll come look at it and they'll say, this isn't our issue. It's a soldier issue. They need to clean it up. Um, so, for example, there's mold in the HVAC vents. How is that a soldier issue? Why isn't DPW looking at that? Just today, there was an issue with. Literally, the, the soldier has a sink in his, 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 his barracks, but the pipe's not connected all the way. And he has a bucket under there to catch the water. And DPW is, I don't know what they're doing. You have another system called ICE, but you can't submit photos. So you can go and submit an issue, what your issue is, but can't submit photos. So how you really have to be really good with words to describe how bad your issue is. But then even when the ICE complaint goes in, the garrison commander may not see it for a month. And by that time, they, in the case of like defects, it's hard to hold a contractor accountable for something that was done a month ago. I'm sure there's more issues that I'm, I can't think of off the top of my head at the moment. Um, maybe Alex has some thoughts as well. Well, I'll share a couple I learned just in the process of my career and talking to a few people. Won't name anybody here. One of my mentors was a brigade commander a while back. And First off, he found that it took being a brigade commander to actually be able to influence barracks and defects. Like he wasn't able to influence it as a battalion commander, which is kind of crazy. But like one of the things he was required to do while in command was submit an assessment of the state of the barracks in his footprint. And so he went around and he checked out all the barracks. His team looked at him. He looked at him, filled out a status report of like where they were in terms of like need for repairs and cleanliness and datedness and whatever. He submitted it. And I don't know which agency it was submitted through, but somewhere along the line, somebody just bumped all the numbers up. Like they took his report and just made it all look better. And like, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what the process was, but he discovered that this had happened and was obviously upset, called up. Better like the barracks were better than they were or Correct. better like he made it look worse. No, like they, they took his report and then like bumped all the ratings up just a little bit so that whoever read the report would assume that the barracks were better off than they actually were in reality. And he was obviously concerned. So like two dead bodies instead of 10. Whatever it was. Who knows? I don't think his were that bad. I don't know. But he was obviously upset about it. And the person tried to explain it as like, oh, like you wouldn't want like big army to think you have a bunch of problems in your footprint. And he was like, no, I want them to know exactly what the state of the footprint is so they know where the resources need to go. And I want to send honest reports to higher headquarters. And that was somehow jarring for them. And then we've got the whole phenomenon of DPW can delete work orders. And so I imagine it comes down to metrics of like number of work orders completed, percent completed, things like that. 
if if you delete work orders, they leave your denominator when you're calculating a percentage. So you get like 10 work orders, seven of them are easy to knock out, three of them would take a lot of work. You knock out the seven easy ones and delete the three hard ones and you have 100% completion rate. And like there's I, I don't know for sure that that is the case. I can't independently verify that, but I've heard dozens and dozens of times of people submitting work orders and then just disappearing from the system mysteriously. Rob, does your platform track like solved problems? Like if I submit something and then it gets solved, is there a way to report that? Yes. Um, I, I want to, uh, before I answer that, yeah. Alex mentioned, so the GAO report actually does talk about how her sergeants and commanders are powerless. Like there are some in the GAO report said like, we know these are issues, but we can't get them fixed for X reason. Um, but yeah, they're, uh, they're they're equally powerless. They want to get these issues resolved and looked at. Yes, they can mark. Uh, we can I can mark issues as resolved and like if there's being action. Um, so when I originally released the app, I didn't have that capability at all. Like I'm just gonna let them report issues. But then it was only fair to show when there's being action taken. So right now, when there's action taken, that action may look like the garrison command. Like right now, if you go into Fort Liberty and look at some of the posts. I've gone through and I marked where the garrison uh, sergeant major has gotten eyes on. He he's investigating, so I can mark stuff as actioned and, and being looked at. Soldiers can reach out to me and let me know, and I'll I'll provide updates. But I I do try to keep things honest and updated when there's action being taken, whatever the latest I have on that is. I want to ask about a somewhat legendary kind of infamous moment. Um, I think it was the Imcom commander. There was another commander there with him. It was filmed. It was broadcast. All this stuff. Um, I I would love your thoughts on that moment mm-hmm. where they essentially. Well, what was the it. moment? Well, they. I'm not going to get word for word. I'll have to find a link and throw it in the show notes so people who missed it can check it out. But they were asked about the barracks stuff, and I they blamed it on. I don't have a discipline. Yeah, problem. they blamed it on a discipline problem of like soldiers not taking care of it enough. Yeah. The soldiers, I have a di- the soldiers have a discipline yeah. problem essentially. Like my take on that is, I think there is a. Part of that is truth. I think there is some truth in that. I don't think that's the complete truth. I think there are probably soldiers out there who are just. I've seen those, po- I, and you know, I've seen those posts on Reddit where soldiers have come through and said, "I have to clean up this soldier's room because they're a hoarder." It like looks like something that should have been like on HDTV or TLC or something like that. Like, I'm I'm pulling a quote up while you're talking. It, it's just a soldier didn't clean up after themselves, or they have like spit cups. Like so, I I. I believe there are some cases where there are soldiers who are not just cleaning up after themselves. But I don't think that's the complete story. Like, how do you describe like everything I see being posted in hots and cots where there's mold and just mold in the rooms? Or I think one soldier posted a room, a picture of like his ceiling was basically a giant bubble because there was a leak above and the paint was like basically forming a bubble from all the water. So I Sure, I respect him. I respect his rank and and who he is, but I don't believe that's the full truth. I don't know how often those high rank officers go through barracks and live in or visit barracks or live in barracks that they have. That's my take on on that. It's interesting because this is his last name is Eisenhower, not to be confused with the more well known Eisenhower whose name starts with an E instead of an <laughs> I. Um, let's see here. Where did that quote go? I've got it good at Fort Hood compared to Fort Story or Fort Liberty, where mold isn't really a problem for us. I will tell senior leaders, quote, I don't have a mold problem. I have a discipline problem. Uh, and he was he was very sure to let people know that he meant that pejoratively. Uh, he meant that as an insult. So interesting take by Major General Eisenhower. Some people, some people did note after that little talk that both of the generals on stage were West Point grads with Roman numerals in their name, and there might have been a little bit of privilege going on. Just speaking from my perspective, like having been an officer through like a fairly normal experience as an officer, there there is no forcing function to ever live in barracks. You could go through an entire officer career without living in barracks. I've batted around the concept of like, maybe if you take command of an organization, you should have to live in that organization's barracks for the first month of your command and like eat in their defect during that month and things like that. I don't know. That's a conversation for another day. What I am kind of curious about is you're, 
you have now relationships with like two garrisons in like a relatively official capacity where you're tracking incidents on their installation, reporting whether they're fixed or not, screening stuff for them. That's a lot of work to do something like completely unofficial, completely free, completely on the side. Do you see any future here for like some kind of actual partnership? Because this is a project they're like dedicating a ton of resources to, and you seem to provide a service where you can cut through a, a communication problem they're having. Yeah. I, I go to bed. There are days I'm like, this would be cool to be a full-time job. Like my, this, I do this on the side, like my kids go to bed and my wife goes to bed or like on during the weekend, or I'll make take a day or two vacation to work on this. Like I would like to have a partnership and this be a full-time job to be able to help this. So like, I want I wish I could go back into the military so I can kind of give back to the soldiers. Like I actually was looking into it um, up until like today, looking at spot, talking to recruiters, try to reenlist. So I can, kind of, I find this is a way to give back to the soldiers. So yeah, I'd like to do this full time. I'd, I'd be open to a partnership for the right for the right folks. Depend, and I can pay my bills still. <laughs> How do you think? Because we've, I mean, Alex and I have had similar conversations in terms of official versus unofficial. But I guess in your case, because you rely so heavily on kind of the the legitimacy of the platform, the anonymity that we talked about, the independence. I mean, how do you maintain that while being folded in under the man, so to speak? Can you rephrase that question differently? Like when you say the man, like my nine to five job or? No, no, no. The man, like the, like the government, the military, like if, if you were to become, you know, an official resource of, of said military, how do you think you maintain that, that freedom of maneuver to use a military oh. term? Yeah, I, I've I've batted around the idea of like what that would look like, like a partnership with the military, because that does complicate things. Because I think part of the draw of Hots and Cots is that I'm not a DOD entity. Like, and I think if the Hots and Cots ever became like a DOD entity, like I, I think you were going to lose some of that that appeal, like being they really anonymous, um, because right now Hots and Cots is like a bottom up type feedback system and that data, there's like a, there's a filter. I can filter kind of a bit of that information. I can keep the building number. I can keep the room number. I can keep the email address away from the DOD to kind of protect that soldier. Um, but I think you lose, uh, absolutely, you're right. You lose that becoming a DOD entity. And I don't, I don't know if I'd want to be a partnership with, like in an official capacity with the DOD. Um, but I know there's organizations out there that do this stuff that are not part of the DOD that I'd be open to or... I don't know. So I think, and there's also somebody mentioned to me before, like once you start taking money from the DOD as like a partner, it kind of changes what that relationship looks like and mm -hmm. your control. And I don't, I don't want to yeah, do that. It sure does. Um, so I think what we originally connected about was some conversation recently about stuff that's going on at the, the Fort Carson, like their defect slash kiosk situation, which we'll get into in a second. Yeah. But if people didn't pick up on it, hots and cots comes from the whole three hots and a cot thing. I did, I think earlier today or maybe yesterday or something like that, try and track down the like real origin of the three hots and a cot phrase. Um, I could not, I could not find like the true origin, but it's been applied to both the military and prison. Um, it's also been applied to some like work environments, <laughs> I guess. but it's, it's the basic idea that like for, for baseline, like taking care of humans, it's, it's, it's a bed and three hot meals, but we have come to discover here in the last few weeks especially as this kiosk stuff has gotten rolled out and correct me if i'm wrong here there is no actual regulatory requirement to provide three hot meals right that's kind of what i've been finding out myself there is no regulation on, on that like um one source uh, told me that if you're an inpatient at a hospital you're you're required to get a hot meal but other than that you don't need, it's not required to get a hot meal. It's just to provide a meal. Cause if it was a hot meal, I wouldn't be getting MREs and <laughs> on those late nights doing training or whatever. Um, so yeah, which by the way, real quick, not a lot of, I, I'm finding out that many don't, there are some that don't know what three hot and a cot is. Like they see hot to cot and they're like, what is that? They're completely lost. They don't have any understanding. I'm like, I should have thought of that when I went through this naming and branding situation with hots and cots. I'll be honest. I didn't, I didn't know until Alex told me. I mean, now that I know what it is, it makes perfect sense, but I'm like, <laughs> I am I'm I mean, I stunned that you've never heard that. Okay. 
Me? Yeah, I would <laughs> assume that like everybody's heard that phrase. No, not all of us went to West Point. I, I assume that too. It has nothing to do with West Point. It's like like if you <laughs> commit a felony and go to jail, at least you can expect three hots and a cot. Like that's a thing that has nothing I've, to do with I've the military. Never, yeah. I've never vected. I've never vectored towards a, a criminal life either. I went to a normal university, and we had. Uh, I don't know what you want to call it. Three, we had all you could eat uh, cafes in a dorm room, and that doesn't brand as nicely as Hots and Cots. So, yeah, it was new to me. <laughs> well, apparently, it's not as well known a thing as either I or Rob assumed it was. Yeah, yeah, I did a survey on 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 uh, what's now X, and there was a decent amount that wasn't aware of what Hots and Cots meant. So I was kind of shocked. Interesting. I will have to message that aggressively on like our stuff. Nobody knows what Mops and Moes means either until we spell it out for them. So it's true. We get that. I want to talk about this kiosk thing, though. Can you guys explain what is going on at Fort Carson? I will let Rob take that one because I think he knows more than I do. Yeah. Do you do you fly often by chance? Yeah. yeah yes. Yes. I've been on an airplane before. Okay. Okay. All right. So you go to like, those little convenience stores like mm-hmm. in an airport. That's what they're doing um at select installations they're replacing deep packs with what looks like a, a convenience replacing store of pre-made food yes replacing um so like at Fort carson they shut down one deep pack during the weekend and that is what is available to soldiers is this kiosk which you can pick from a selection um, it's like six selections. You get like one fruit, like uh, you can pick like granola bar or cheese stick and then like a meal. But that meal could be a sandwich that was made on Friday or like a frozen Jimmy Dean meal. Some of the things I've seen. Um, I think some of the stuff I saw is like a jello pudding cup. It's like all this high processed food, um, nothing really freshly made type stuff. And and I will mention because he's he's talking about like processing of foods and things like that. And to get ready for this conversation, because I'm the nerd who reads the doctrine and the policy stuff, I decided to go look up some of that. And it is true that I can't find a thing that specifies how many hot meals you're required to get. And I get why that's a thing. The DOD spans wide spectrums of situations, right? You got people on submarines, you got people on boats, you got people in Antarctica, you got people in the field and combat and all sorts of different things where you can't have like a policy that is super enforceable across all those things. But the, the DOD policy does indeed talk about like minimizing processed foods, having whole foods, having like a certain number of your offerings be hot and fresh and things like that. Like that's all in there. It just doesn't seem like it has any teeth to make it required. Well, I mean, it's also, it's also in there that everybody does high weight and ABCP, but that doesn't happen. I mean, I think ABCP is enforced better than some of this stuff is. What what I think we probably need on the back end of this is that we need to invite somebody, whether it's like a really high level food service warrant or somebody who's been involved in some of these DOD nutrition subcommittee meetings that they're all doing, somebody who can speak to like what the policy actually is. Because it seems like there's enough loopholes in there that as long as you meet some baseline calorie requirements you can you don't have to provide them a setting and like the whole conversation that rob and i started having before we got on here over the last week or something like that and i i put this on the reddit page when this was all blowing up on there is that one thing that the policy doesn't talk about at all is the value of just breaking bread together as people that are members of the same community you can't really quantify that very well yeah but it absolutely matters and one thing i can say from traveling all over the army and visiting a ton of different defects it's really easy. There's there's one thing that distinguishes the good defects from the bad defects, and that is that the commander eats there. If if the commander eats there, it's going to be good. They're going to make sure it's good. People are going to come. People are going to care about being there. They're going to see each other. And if the commander doesn't go, nobody's going to care about it. And like that person's the one with the power to fix it, but it's not a problem to them because they never see it and they can ignore it. Yeah, there is something about being able to sit down with your team and your the folks you work with and be able to like you said Alex break thread because the kiosks don't have that they have maybe they have maybe I, I haven't seen the full scope of it but my understanding is like there might be a table a, a handful of tables and some chairs but <clears throat> I think like when you get in a dining facility available to eat and sit down with folks um and the concern is like is this going to replace all dining facilities is this going to be it 
But why go the route of kiosks when you have something like Fort Jackson is doing with Victory Fresh, where it's like a salad bar, and I think they have like a hot, like a hot aisle where you can get like like fresh pizzas made and some other stuff. But which is a little bit, I think, more appealing than a kiosk of sandwiches that were made on Friday, and now you're going on Sunday, and it's a soggy or maybe stale bread, or if there's even any sandwiches left after you get there, because after and I think one post that was submitted on hot spots like an hour later it was pretty picked over there wasn't much left so you come an hour or two hours later your choice is going to be really limited and then something that's high quality something that's good especially if you're going to be depending what you're doing in the military depending what your job is if you're kicking indoors and doing stuff like that you're going to be burning way more calories than maybe like me was a fueler where i'm not doing something as intensive um somebody like who's in infantry or something well, I mean, I get the, and you'll probably have better visibility of this than I do, but I've I've gotten the impression just based on how the Army specifically is rolling out, you know, the whole embedded human performance model and kind of rebranding defects as warrior restaurants or insert fancy name. And it just, it seems like a lot of money is being, ve- being invested into like one facility at the expense of several surrounding facilities but then you now have this picture that you can brief from and this story that you can use and it's like well great that works well for the guys and gals that are in the radius of that facility but there's six or eight others that aren't even staffed and you have to replace them with a kiosk is that kind of the sense that you've picked up from from what people are submitting uh yeah um it is. And some of those kiosks are like an hour away. They don't, not everybody has a vehicle to get to these kiosks either. So how are they going to get to them? Are they going to walk the seven miles? So now they burned all the calories walking back. And now they're going to, when they get back to their barracks, they're going to be hungry again. Um, and they don't, any food they buy is going to come out of pocket for them because they don't get like BAH or anything like that to supplement for food. Are defects, and this is a dumb civilian question for you guys, but defects, that's contracted out or is that intrinsic to It depends. And that's a, that's a big part of the conversation, conversation is that a lot of this comes from a shortage of cooks. Um, and the Army is obviously experiencing recruiting difficulties. Every branch is experiencing recruiting difficulties. Uh, I think I read somewhere that the Army is at like 70% strength on cooks and when when you're squeezed on manning like what's going to get picked first field feeding deployment or defects right you're going to you're going to do the things where there's no choice whatsoever like if if you don't provide field feeding it's not like they can just like go stop by the px while they're in the field no like they're going to starve you have to do that deployment you have a choice now between like sending your cooks on a mission that they're in the army to do or paying whatever exorbitant price KBR charges to run an overseas defect. Uh, so like it is, I do understand that leaders are in a hard position prioritizing the limited number of cooks they have towards the variety of demands that are out there. But there are absolutely contracted defects, CONUS as well. Like the one I ate at at Fort Eustis for a while in my last job was all contractors. And I think that's a whole conversation about what are we willing to spend. So I was talking with somebody uh, yesterday um, in, on Instagram who was in, in food services. And one of the things he mentioned was like the quality of life cooks were talking about was just not great. Mm-hmm. So a lot of them are reclassing. So that's all you're losing those cooks. And I mean, cooks get a lot of hate. I mean, there is a lot of, uh, of hate towards cooks because of just the portion they get from cooks when you go to a defect that isn't the best because uh, and then also you have situations like raw chicken uh just not great food quality so the cooks get a lot of pain they're like i've someone said like i've had enough i don't want to deal with this i'm gonna go reclass um i was when i started hot and hot i met with somebody from an installation who oversees the contractors and this kind of goes into uh, several things like why are not why are soldiers not eating at dining facilities? Is it food quality? I'm sure there's probably a multitude of reasons why. Um, but one of the things she said, and this kind of goes back to the ice comments, she will get an ice comment for like a month later of somebody who maybe reports raw food. She can't really do anything to hold that contractor acceptable to improve the quality of food. So a month later, she gets the report of this chicken wasn't cooked right or this fish was raw. 
so she can't do anything. So now the co- contract is continually just serving subpar food and nothing can be done. So soldiers are like, I'm not going to eat there. I'll just go and make my own food or buy my own food or go eat at Wendy's, go eat at Burger King or go eat somewhere else, fast food, which is just feeding into the whole eating crappy. I do. We've, we talked about this. This was like a topic of discussion on Reddit, I think, was that you like senior leaders are watching what soldiers are doing and trying to like provide solutions that fit with that. And it can lead them down the wrong road. Right. If like, we know that soldiers aren't really eating a defects, we look at where they are eating, replicating where they are eating might not be the answer. Right. Because like the reasons they're not eating at the defect aren't because they would rather eat subway every day. It might be because subway is the only thing that's open at the hours they can actually get there is close enough to their location that they can get there in the amount of time they have, et cetera, et cetera. It's not because Subway is the ultimate food that all soldiers want. It just happens to be, it meets the criteria that soldiers are going to choose based on a bunch of other constraints. And I, I think we have to have like real conversations about like, if they're all going to the shop at, that does not mean you should recreate the shop at. It means you should address the reasons that they're not going to the defag. <laughs> I, I mentioned before that I was digging into this a little bit and I do want to share One piece of the DOD manual, two pieces I found really interesting. One's short and one I'll talk about a little longer. One is that the DOD does delegate to the secretary of the army, the responsibility to be the executive agent for establishing DOD nutrition requirements. So like, I know we've talked a lot about the army here and I have an army background and Rob has an army background and Drew's working with the army, but there is like the army does have a significant ownership role in DOD wide nutrition beyond just the army itself. Um, But going past that was like, what does, what is the DOD's food service program mission? And it says like it charges the service chiefs, the heads of each of the services to provide, and this is a quote, high quality and cost effective food service to authorize military and civilian personnel and to provide nutritionally balanced meals that will optimize performance, improve readiness, maximize resiliency to authorized personnel. So I think. I, I know it's unenforceable because those are just like aspirational things. But if we're talking about performance, readiness, and resiliency, we have to talk about the role that like the environment that eat in plays wanting to go there, eating as a team, building team cohesion, the value that like hot meals have towards like resiliency and quality of life and things like that. Like these are all in the mission. So theoretically they're important. And I just don't see that happening if we try and do the whole like we, we talk on here about the McNamara fallacy all the time where you care only about things that are quantifiable. It's easy to quantify calories. It's easy to quantify macronutrients. I can give you like a perfectly nutrient balanced sludge until you have met all the requirements. That's not the same as providing for performance, readiness, and resiliency. I don't know. Okay, I'll rephrase it better this time. And I guess what I'm getting at is this idea that I have seen, which is that nutrition and and food and the whole thing that surrounds that i'm like defects kiosks what whatever fast food on base all of it seems to boil down to like red yellow green is it healthier is it not how many calories are in here and then are we meeting some kind of objective quantifiable requirement that we've given ourselves and i'm curious to see if there's a way at some point that they can figure out how to inject more of the the word soft skills comes to mind, but I don't think that's the right way of phrasing it, but just kind of the softer part of nutrition, like the role that it can play in team cohesion, resiliency, lethality, whatever buzzword, eating together, focusing more on the quality of nutrition, quality of life, all of these things versus, oh, the latest you know USDA guidelines say you have to have 2000 calories. We met that requirement because we gave you a uh, six ounce chicken breast and 18 crackers. I think you're on to something because like with anything with like a military side, anything you're doing fitness wise relies so much on also your nutrition. Um, and I think there's a lot of, you're putting a lot of energy into some of these jobs in the military, which would, and even with the AFCT, you're doing a lot of physicalness, like to try to get your, to get your score, to get the highest possible score. Like I used to run like up until two years ago, I was doing like ultra marathons and I can tell the difference in my body when I ate complete trash, like a whole row of Girl Scout cookies versus something that was healthy. Like I felt different on my run. Um, and th- I think there's something to be said about that. And it relays that to also whatever you're doing in the military wise as well. So 
I think there's a there's an aspect of teaching soldiers on how to eat healthy because I don't know if that's being done. Um, you have the place you can go get a hamburger if you want, and maybe there's nothing wrong with getting a hamburger every now and then. But if you're going every day to get a hamburger, that kind of presents problems. I think we are doing a decent, a decent job with job. the education. I mean, I Drew leads an H2F team right now. He's got dietitians that are theoretically teaching people this stuff. But I think, and we t- we've talked about this on previous episodes. When we had Dr. Mozafarian on, we talked a lot about like, can you educate your way out of a public health problem? And I think education has its role and we should do it and it helps. But at the same time, if you don't fix the structural issues, because like soldiers probably aren't choosing mm-hmm. Burger King because they think it's optimal performance and nobody's told them it's not. They probably know it's not great for them. They're probably choosing it because it's fast and it's cheap and it's hyper palatable and all these things and it's it's predictable and they know what they're going to get. And if the defect that is within a mile of them is closed, yeah. it might be the only option left within like three miles. Who knows? Um, so I think there's there's both the education and the structural part of this whole thing. See, I don't, I don't think we're doing a good job educating. I mean, I think H2F is doing a good job. I mean, shout out H2F. But like, I'm just thinking of, I, for some reason in my head, every time we have these conversations, I go back to like every collegiate football setup i've ever been to and they do the same kind of education that the military does you know they have the different acronyms and like they might even have the red yellow green stuff to indicate like this is healthy this is not but they also surround those athletes with a like a choice architecture that drives them towards making that good decision and then they help facilitate that good decision and they show the athlete by virtue of where they're putting their money that like hey we care about your nutrition and we understand that the nutrition is related to your performance. I think because we're still fighting this battle of like contracted AFEs, fast food, whatever, against this defect that I think if you asked any soldier what their impression of the defect was, it would be like a dimly lit Cold War cafeteria with like an old cafeteria lady and like some shaky jello. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You see the warrior restaurant stuff being advertised and all that, but I just... I, I don't think that they're really doing the best that they can. I don't know. I, I could be on my own with that opinion, but that's just what I see. One of the things that when I started Hots and Cots was being able to compare, let, let the Army, let the DOD compare insulation. So if an insulation, one insulation has a rating, an average rating for their food-wise, let's say four, and another one, another insulation has a rating of, of two, let the DOD determine, let the Army, whoever, they can open up the app. They can see that what's being posted. It, no one's stopping them. Compare the installations. Like, what is this installation doing well? Why are they getting a four and why is ours getting a two? I mean, that's something that I had in mind when I created this, like this rating system. It's The information's there. Um, so why can't other installations learn from what other, other installations are doing? Because I know there are good installations out there. I know there's tiny facilities that are doing Knocking out of the park with great meals. And then there are some that are just, I don't, I don't know, phoning it in. Um, why is that? Who's doing the best? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to, I, I, you put me on the spot. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I'd have to go and look, honestly. Um, who's, who's doing the worst? Do you know who's doing the worst? Like for food wise or just overall? Which which one's going to get you in the least amount of trouble? I, I'm not too worried about that. Um, I have my 214. They can't take that from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, right now, Fort Campbell's on my mind because a new soldier got a new room with a dead mouse in the corner. So uh, that they had a couple of posts come up that I've seen not great. Food-wise... Uh, I've been getting a lot more barracks related issues, not so much food wise. Fort Meade is not going to actually, Fort Meade is not going to add a part with their food. Um, there's also uh, an installation over in Germany uh, that has done really well with their food as well. Um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. But those are the two right now that come to mind that have done really well with their food and, and getting soldiers their food. I, I do want to cover two quick things before we keep rolling one is and this is in response to what drew said about collegiate athletics programs i think if you really got behind the curtain and figured out how many of those athletes despite all that perfect stuff around them still make the choice to go seek out the nearest fast food 
it'd be a pretty frustrating number because having talked to a lot of guys in collegiate sport, that is still a problem. Even when you're literally providing the meals for free, they will still go get a burger across the street. That is true. Um, but then another piece is, and I think I'm sure you're aware of this, Rob, but like talk to anybody who's been in the service industry, restaurants, whatever. You, like it takes like five, 10 times as many good experiences to get a single review as it does bad experiences, right? People are much more motivated to take pictures and talk about things that are huge problems. So I wonder to like, one, is the sample size big enough to get a really good idea yet? I think you're still growing and getting more awareness and people are discovering hots and cots as we speak. But two, you're, you are likely to hear the worst of what is going on. Like how many soldiers, I, I, there's the thing going on with like Fort Brett or Fort Liberty, they're sharing like some pretty cool barracks rooms that people have like worked on and made pretty neat. And that's, that's like starting to get some traction. Some of those are insane. It's it's pretty impressive. There's some really cool stuff there. And you wouldn't like I think if you had like only seen all of the like horror story pictures of like flooded buildings and mold and dead rodents and things like that, you might have no idea that there is some good stuff out there. And I think part of that's the problem with the defects too, is I think I think there are a huge number of soldiers who never give the defect a chance because they've heard all this bad stuff. So they don't know whether the defect around them is any good. They've just heard too many horror stories, so they go to Burger King. Yeah, um, and that is something I've tried to, even now, like, from the launch, like, when I launched Hobbs and Cods, like, when we were doing this, we didn't want to be an app just for complaints. Like, I want to show the good and the bad, because there is some great barracks, like, you just, we were just talking about, like, and I want to see that stuff, too, because I get equally excited about seeing that. I'd rather see a great, a ton of posts on great-looking barracks, like, something that came straight out of Ikea or something that, uh, like, a mold situation, I know they're there and I want to see that. I want to be able to highlight which, because there are great leaders out there taking care of their soldiers. And there's also great leaders that are doing what they can with the resources they have. Um, but sometimes there are just leaders who are not advocating the best for their soldiers. And I don't know if they really realize how they're living uh, and what issues they're dealing with. And also, I think there's also a component of uh, soldiers are still hesitant of going to their leaders to report issues because they don't know what type of repercussions they're going to have because when I was in, and it's gotten a lot better, but there was a stigma of coming forward and saying you were having PTSD issues or you were having mental health issues because you were afraid what that was going to do to your career. I mean, thankfully that stigma has gotten way better, but I wonder if there's still a stigma of like going to your chain of command about and, and making a scene or not making a scene, I shouldn't say that, reporting an issue not getting resolved by DPW um, because they don't know what's going to happen if they go up to their sergeant major or their captains. Do we know when, like, the bear? Because, I, I, I mean, I think, like, moldy barracks is kind of a, a thing these days. Has it always been that way? I mean, when we go back, back, back to, like, World War II, maybe even before that, like, has this just been the state of things for lodging in the military? Or did something happen at some point that just kind of tanked the whole soldier housing situation? Some of the feedback I've seen from soldiers that um, they said, like old old school soldiers said they had mold issues. They were terrible. I think there was a component of it that it was always kind of like this. Maybe not as bad. Um, my my theory is things just kind of got out of hand. With We were in a constant state of war for 20 years. So things just kind of got pushed to the wayside to focus on that. And now not paying attention to barracks is now catching up to us. That That's my theory. I don't know if that's really the case or not. But I think even when I was in, there was issues with some barracks. I don't remember being it as bad as what it is now, but it seems like now it's way worse. I think there's definitely a history of like crappy buildings in the military. I mean, we used to have whole units living in tents for long periods and things like that, right? So like this is not without precedent, but at the same time, I do know that like there was the Congressional Quality of Life hearing recently and like the Armed Services Committee has been talking about how the DOD like lodging maintenance backlog it's never it hasn't been funded to the 100 percent of what's required just to keep up with maintenance in like decades probably and so we've had this growing deferred maintenance problem on a lot of the buildings it probably is uniquely bad right now just because they've been able to get away with ignoring it for a long time which which kind of brings me to a question that's come up a few times the ga report actually talks a little bit about this like how the arm dod has 14 billion dollars to like to use towards repairs and and improving barracks and such but they can't account for where that money's going to yeah. go 
I think that's part of the issue. It's like you have a bucket of money, but you're like, we don't know what we're going to do with it. We'll do something with it, which is part of the problem. It's like you should have like a list that you should have something to show, okay, these are the bears that are in dire straits. We need to get these looked at immediately. Well, I was going to say real quick, like it's weird to me. I know people first, people first isn't necessarily the catchphrase anymore, is it? It's changed. Technically, we retired that one. Well, I just think from like an accounting standpoint, you know, like you mentioned billions and billions of dollars and I'm just looking at my budget and I'm like, okay, well, people are first. So let's just fill those buckets and then let's go down the line to the other buckets. But it's like, no, no, we got to get more F-35s and rockets in the air. (laughs) The mold is because those soldiers are not disciplined. So let's just push that. Or I don't know. That's. It's not really a question. It's just a gripe. It's just interesting to me that you wouldn't fill that piece first because it's not going to get any better, is it? I think we're trying to avoid a situation when we initially went to into Iraq and Afghanistan and that we didn't have up armored vehicles. They literally were lining their vehicles with sandbags. So I think we're trying to continually stay ahead, a step ahead of everything with our technology and our gear. So the next, whenever the next war kicks off, we're not kind of in that same situation. I, I don't know if that's really it. That's just kind of my theory, my thoughts. Well, Drew's asking a dangerous question, which is, are people really first or were people really first? And I don't think we have time on this podcast to dive into that. I can't ask that anymore because they retired the phrase for me. I can't, I got to pick something else. <laughs> I think that's a whole other podcast on the whole people first thing and where that's at. In an effort to like keep this on the rails a little bit, and like draw us towards a close here. One thing that was brought up at the quality of life hearing, and I don't know if it was brought up in the GAO report or not, but it was definitely brought up by armed services committee members was they pointed to the privatization of on post housing as a success story. Some people might agree with that. Some people might disagree with that. There've certainly been issues. I don't think we have time on this podcast for me to explain how incredibly frustrating it is that Balfour Beatty was found guilty of fraud and then awarded another multi-million dollar contract immediately after being found guilty. That's insane. But whether or not we consider privatized housing a success, do you think privatization is a good option for barracks? And I, for me, I mean, I moved into like a number of apartments in my life and there's like move in inspections, move out inspections. If there are issues, they get fixed. But that's also because those people are profiting off of it and there's not a profit incentive with the barracks. Like, is this, is privatized barracks something you would consider a potential solution to this? I, that's a tough one. Um, my limited scope of privatizing, like the housing situation, like I haven't heard, heard good things about it. I think there's a way to take pieces of what privatized housing has done and incorporate it in, into barracks while keeping the army and the DOD over it. But I don't know, like, what does that look like if we privatize barracks? Does that mean now soldiers can have pets? Um, now, does that mean the first sergeant and commander don't have access? Which I don't think they should be just going into soldiers' rooms, like, without kind of some sort of knowledge. But I mean, what does that look like now? Like, because right now, your commander can't just walk into your house, like, or your first sergeant. So what does that look like? So now... Now, Private Snuffy has a cat, but now they're about to go to JRTC. So now he has to find a cat sitter. Um, what's that look like? Who's going to maybe somebody has a side hustle to come feed your cat and clean the litter box? I, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's, but I think that maybe take parts of what privatized housing has done. Like you can't request a history, a work order history on your barracks. Like that's a, maybe a starter, allow soldiers to be able to request a work order history of what has been done in those barracks. Um, has it had a mold issue? Has it had leak issues? Like, I don't know. Or if we can change the policy of who can live off post. Right now, the army, you have to be an E5 to live off post versus I think the Navy, you can be an E3. You have, you can be an E4 and live off post. Like, that's actually something the DOD don't align on. Each branch, you can be a, have it's a different rank structure and who can live on and off post and get the age. So what if we make changes to that policy of who can live off post and such? Hmm. This is me being naive. Would you have that threshold go lower to live off post or would you increase it? I think if you're an E1 to E3, it's fair to say maybe you should be living on in the barracks. You're still fresh out of living out of just leaving your house. Correct. Maybe you're an E1, E3 and maybe have an age bracket. Like, 
imagine being an E3 and you're 30 years old living in the barracks. You had some 20 year old first sergeant coming in or maybe 25 year old E7 coming in telling you how you should live your life and how you should be in your room or whatever. I hope that there's a 30 year old who has some idea and decency of how to live by themselves and keeping things clean. I think there's ways to maybe make changes to the policies on, on that. If you can reduce who's living in barracks, there's less of a footprint you have to maintain in theory. Yeah. I mean, I, we've talked about that before in a number of different, I guess, colors in terms of the goodness that sometimes can come from shrinking a footprint versus growing a footprint, but certainly with the barracks. And I would argue probably with defects too. You're introducing transportation though, which gets really hard when you yeah. cannot assume that every service member comes in with any kind of transportation or even a license. That That is true also. That is something else you need to, well, but then again, you have transportation issues already now on post true. with dining facilities where soldiers have to go and walk a mile, like seven miles to the nearest defect. So like we're just moving one chain transportation issue to another location but no you're absolutely right that's another part of this yeah i mean i solved this for the air force just introduce bike shares on bases or get those um what are those scooters called lime yeah throw some lime scooters over there on these installations and see <laughs> see how that goes over i think they might have tried it i'm pretty <laughs> sure it got tried somewhere oh man well, okay, here, Rob, you set yourself up for, for our classic closer. And I want to ask you this. I'll ask you two two parts okay. to this one because I want to know your opinions on kind of the hots and the cots. And and that is this. If you had the keys to the kingdom, given all the in, information you're receiving from all these soldiers, what changes let's 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 go this way. What three changes would you make for sort of the defect structure? And then what three changes would you make for kind of the barracks situation? You're, you're completely in charge. You have all, all the funding. You didn't know you were getting a six part question, did you? No, this is the first six part I've ever asked. And if, if you want to blow that structure out of the water because it's ludicrous, feel free. I'm just curious if you had the, you know, like I said, keys of the kingdom, all the money in the world, whatever resources, what would you do? So I have the kings in the kingdom. I can make whatever structure changes I want to, like dying facilities and, and living situations, right? I'm talking like Putin levels of authority. Uh, I think one, I think I think there are soldiers who like to eat and they don't want to be, they don't want to sit with folks. I think having some sort of like meal prep service, like, I don't know, there's tons of them out there. I, the one most recent one I can think of is Factor. I think something like that. Fort Johnson's doing something similar where they have pre-made meals already there and it has the macros out, the calories and everything. Have something like that provided for the soldiers. You can even do like if you want to do like what is it? One of the meal prep services I can think of, mm -hmm. Blue Apron or like something like that. Maybe soldiers like to cook. I know there's so there's probably soldiers that like to cook their own food, and they can be able to control what they're eating better. Maybe they have some sort of food tolerance. Give something like that to soldiers. If you, I think keeping the defect is important. I think if you want to do the kiosks, have it as a supplement. Don't replace defects with it. Let soldiers have that option. Living wise. And I think I, I, I go back to get letting changing the threshold of who can live off post and give them BAH. Let soldiers decide if they can, if they meet certain qualifications, you have a vehicle, you have a clean driving record, let them live off post, give them BAH. Don't let them, otherwise, they're going to go marry some first woman they find just to get out of the barracks. And then that just presents a whole other issue now that your commander has to deal with of private snuffy now is getting a divorce and whatever. I think better accountability for DPW on who's doing the repairs um, and barracks and, and maybe barracks managers maybe have someone dedicated to the barracks maintaining it. I mean, you have maintenance dedicated to an apartment complex. So maybe have two or three individuals who are completely just dedicated to that barracks building, um, something like that, to make those improvements, to make those repairs, because I think that would be some of the stuff. And then I think also making leadership a little bit more approachable for these issues so soldiers can go talk to them about what issues they're having because i think some of those issues go unnoticed by their leaders i think also the leaders some there are some leaders out there who are i live like this my barracks are like this and i turned out fine so, so um, i'm not gonna make it i'm not gonna i'm not gonna push your issue forward to try to get it fixed because i turned out fine well i think in order to eventually give rob the keys to the kingdom what he, he needs, needs is, is 
more people to use hots and cots, more people to submit reviews, more people to submit pictures and things like that. And as we can see, he's successfully like driving some actual accountability through that. So if you listen to this and you are somebody who lives on base or you have soldiers or sailors or airmen or Marines or guardians who live on barracks and dorms and eat in defects and all that stuff, I think if we had one takeaway from this, for me at least, it would be we need to get more people using the platform so we can get more accountability at the highest level. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Because I, I will add, having that information helps me have those conversations when I meet with congressional members, because I've met with a few from the Armed Forces Committee and I do share that stuff. So the more data I have, the more I can share with them that, uh, of what I'm seeing. Well, all right. Thanks for coming on. We know what to do now. Thanks for having me. me. Hey, Alex, let's cover our ass real quick. Oh, great idea, Drew. All right, guys. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Before you go, please rate and review the pod on the listening platform of your choice. You can also visit us on our website at www.mopsinmos.com. That's mops, the letter in, mos.com. You can check out the library of podcast episodes, our latest blog entries, any helpful resources, and also sign up for our newsletter. Drew nailed it. Just to underline a couple of things, the podcast entries have in-depth show notes on the website. So if you missed anything or you want to read any of the research we talk about, it is all there. You can, at the bottom of the website, sign up with your email and we receive future updates from us. The blog posts go a little bit more in depth in kind of written form on a couple of topics we get questions about all the time. But most importantly, I just want to ask all you guys, our best way the word gets out is absolutely word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell the people you work with, anybody you think would find it useful. Thanks for spreading the word. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot us an email at either Drew or Alex at mopsandmos.com. Or there's a contact form on the website.